Welcome to another exciting podcast of Royal Oak Victory Church. We're glad you've joined us. We are a community devoted to God, connected to others, and influencing our world. Thank you, guys. It's awesome. So we're going to jump right in. Uh, Make sure you grab your uh, paper or whatever you're going to take notes on because we're going to go through this morning quite quickly. If you've been with us, uh, we are going through a series that we've entitled Doing Business with God. And what we have uh, endeavored to do, what we've desired to do, is to give you some practical tools that you can then take and apply to your places of work. Uh, And for me, it really has felt, in my opinion, a lot like going back to school because Over the last couple of weeks, I've taken in so much information. I've taken all these notes, and I'm like, man, I'm just going to need some time to process it. So I want to warn you, this morning's going to be no different. It's going to feel like you're going back to school. You're going to get a lot of information, but uh, don't fret uh, because it is valuable information. Now, the reason we have been going through this series uh, is in some ways down to a very simple statistic. And that is that you're probably going to spend about 40% of your life at work. 40% of your life at work. And some of you guys, oh, I don't know if I want to do that. But that's what the statistics tell us, about 40% of our life. And so I think it's important that we as a church get God's perspective on what work is all about, what he has in store for us. And I mean, we often define even our lives by this workplace, right? We introduce ourselves, we say, hi, I'm Sheldon and I work at so-and-so, or I do this, or uh, I'm an accountant, or I'm an engineer. It, in a lot of ways, defines us. And so the practical aspect of this series is for you to give you those tools that is, takes over so much of your life. Now, two weeks ago, uh, we started the series off and Pastor Dave uh, went through a seri- uh, first sermon that talked about how we're supposed to approach work, how we're supposed to kind of tackle it, so to speak. And last week we looked at uh, an acrostic called SHAPE, uh, which stands for spiritual gifts, heart, abilities, personality, and experiences. Because that aspect of our lives uh, greatly impacts our work and it should impact what we do for a living, what work we choose to do. And today we're going to look at part three, which is making wise decisions at work. Studies show us uh, that we make approximately 612 decisions every day. Now, this is an average, uh, but 612 decisions every day. And if we assume we can split that into three equal eight-hour segments, one for sleep, one for home, one for work. Now, I know I'm being really generous on the sleep one for a lot of you, but let's just For ease of math, we'll say that one-third of our time is spent sleeping. Uh, If we take that, then what we can assume is that half of your decisions are going to be made at work. It's assuming, of course, that you don't make decisions in your sleep and you've acquired some type of skill that I don't have. So what you're talking about is that you're going to make work-related decisions in a day of approximately 306 decisions. Approximately 306 decisions you're going to make are strictly related to work in a day. Now, it's average, but you can just see very clearly how important it is that we make wise decisions with our time. And so when Pastor Dave asked me to take this Sunday a few weeks back, I started going over all of the leadership books that I have on my shelf. I'm an avid reader, and I started flipping through them, looking for highlights and underlines and this sort of thing. Uh, And I've read a lot over the last six months, and I started going, okay, what am I going to do? What am I going to pick? And I started going through, okay, which author can I really rely on? What can I go through and and take a book and I go, okay, can I trust this person? And I started evaluating, okay, what's this person's history? What have they shown me? What have they done for me lately? Kind of an attitude, right? How big of a company did they run? How successful were they? Did they fail and then build themselves back up? Uh, What do other people have to say about their book? In a lot of ways, I was just trying to figure out that trust level for that book. And out of all the books I read, I did find two that were written by one person. He was probably one of the most successful CEOs, if not the most successful CEO in history. His organization was huge. It was incredibly successful. It was admired the world over. Now, some of you are thinking that maybe this is John D. Rockefeller, right? He ran Standard Oil uh, in the 1920s and 1930s. Uh, It's because of his prominence in the business world that we have rules now against monopolies. 
Um, and it's kind of where the game Monopoly came from is actually because of how much he controlled. But it wasn't him. Now, maybe you're thinking it's Bill Gates or as Apple would like to tell you over the last week or so that it was maybe about Steve Jobs. Um, it's not him either. Or maybe you've got uh, Jack Welch, who ran GE for years and years, or maybe it's Donald Trump and all of his hair glory, right? <laughs> who is it, right? Who, which author has the most to tell us? Well, to me, when I started going through it, I realized that it was none other than King Solomon. And I picked this picture just because he's rocking the beard. <laughs> he's got the best one of all, I think. But he's the most successful CEO in history. He ruled a powerful empire, one of the largest in the world. He was considered one of the most wisest and wealthiest people to ever live on our planet. It was so much so that kings and queens would visit, would travel for days and weeks on end just to talk with him, just to ask him questions, to hear of his wisdom. And we're talking in the era when we're talking uh, camels and we're talking good old-fashioned footsteps to go see this guy. And people would travel for a long time to go see him. And thankfully for us, two of his books are still available. And those are the books of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes in the Bible. So if you've got your Bible with you this morning, uh, pull it out, flip to the book of Proverbs. We're going to be spending uh, most of our morning uh, flipping through this book in various ways. Um, so I want to make sure you have it. If you're looking for it, flip your Bible about halfway open. You'll probably hit Psalms and it's the book right after that. Now, within these two uh, books are pages and pages and pages of incredible wisdom for all aspects of our life. And that includes decision making processes for work and business and finance and wealth. In fact, when you look at these books and specifically the book of Proverbs, we actually find that King Solomon outlined an eight-step process for making decisions. So we're going to go through that this morning. We're going to go through them quickly because of the time we have. So I encourage you to write them down. But what I want to say right off the bat before we even hit step one is that these steps have to be taken in sequential order. So when you look at them, you can't just go to three and then to seven and then to eight you have to do them one through eight in that order. And if at any point in time you have to stop, then you don't go to the next step, right? So if three is what's holding you back, you don't do four and five and six. Does that make sense? So we go through this. We just want to make sure that we put that ground rule in place. Because as we go through these steps, it really is about making wise decisions at work. Now, before we go into the steps, I want all of you to do one thing. If you've got paper and pen, pull it out. If you've got your tablet, your phone, whatever it is, I want you to write down at the very top of that page the one decision that you are struggling with right now. Whether it's work-based, whether it's at home, whatever it is, I want you to write that decision at the very top of the page because we're going to refer back to it over the course of the morning. We're going to take these steps one by one and we're going to look back at the problem and ask questions about that problem. And I'm sure all of you very easily can go, okay, you know what? I'm facing this at work, or I'm doing this. I need to make sure I get this down. So that's what I want you to do. Maybe it's a project. You're trying to figure out whether to go to the left or go to the right to make sure that it gets completed. Make sure it's a, maybe it's a relationship, right? It could be a work relationship, a home relationship. Maybe it's a friendship. And you're trying to figure out, okay, I need to grow this relationship. I need to go deeper. Maybe you've got a conflict brewing and you need to deal with it. You can apply these steps to it. Maybe you're thinking of going back to work after an extended period of time. Maybe you're thinking of going back to school. And it's been a long time since you've stepped into a classroom. Whatever it is, every one of us this morning has some type of a decision that we have to make that we're looking to work our way through. And so as we go through this, I want you to contemplate that question, that decision, uh, and apply these steps practically to that as we go. Because I have no doubt in my mind that at the end of today, you're going to have at least the practical steps in place to be able to make that decision more effectively and with more wisdom. James 1.8 says, a person who is double-minded, that is a person who cannot make up their mind, is unstable in all they do. So this morning, I'm hoping to bring some stability to you guys to be able to make that decision instead of being double-minded. And so if you're here 
uh, you're listening online, you want to be able to make sure you have that ready to go. And as we jump into the first step, I want you to turn to the person next to you and tell them, you know what, I'm ready to make my decision. All right. So these steps, like I said, are going to come fast and furious. We're going to go through them uh, quickly. I encourage you to write them down. The first step is check the Bible. Check the Bible. Now, when Mary and I were expecting our first child a few years back, I remember the first thing that I wanted to do was get as much information as possible, right? I, it's almost like I needed a manual for life, right? I had to figure this thing out. So I read as many books as I could. I read what to expect when you're expecting, which is kind of the classic. And I grabbed a bunch of other books and resources and I got as much information as I could. But it took a gentle reminder from God to say, you know what? you're forgetting probably the most important book. You're forgetting the one that's going to give you the answers that you need no matter what comes your way with your kids. And that is the Bible. I mean, this should seem pretty self-explanatory to us. Check the Bible. It makes sense. But I also think it's one of the most common mistakes that we make when looking for answers, especially when we're dealing with with what we consider day-to-day questions. Like, what am I going to do at work? What am I going to do with this problem? We forget that we have this instruction manual and that it has the answers to life's questions. In fact, the Bible itself says that it is life to us. It is our bread. It is our sustenance. And we need to treat it as such. Whether it's the Old Testament or the New Testament, we see over and over again expertise and guidance on success, wealth, Uh, business problems, family issues, all of that type of stuff. In the Old Testament, we see examples through illustration. We see stories. Uh, We see Joseph and Moses and and Nehemiah, all who were great leaders and had to deal with people problems and, and organizational problems, logistics and all this type of stuff. And we see in the New Testament, we see examples through Jesus' teaching and his parables and and ministering, as well as the letters uh, that Paul wrote Uh, to the different churches. A lot of the time he's talking about administrative issues and who should take leadership and what you should do in this situation and that situation. So we have these answers. Proverbs 2, 6 through 8 says, For the Lord grants wisdom. His every word is a treasure of knowledge and understanding. He grants good sense to the godly, his saints. He is their shield, protecting them and guarding their pathway. And we see in this scripture, five promises, five promises that God will give us if we listen to him, if we slow down and and start to figure things out. And I want you to uh, take the time now to either underline these or circle them, whatever you need to do to be able to go back to them. And that is wisdom, knowledge, understanding, good sense. Sometimes it's called common sense, which somebody once told me is not so common anymore. And then finally, protection. These five things are promised to us in Scripture that if we look in the Bible, if we listen to what God says, He will give these to us as we're making a decision. And I know that when I'm faced with a decision, these are the five things that I would want. I know that these are the promises that I would want. And some of our stressing or fretting or whatever it is over the problem that we're facing is because we haven't stopped to check the Bible. We haven't stopped to see what God is saying. And not just, I'm waiting to hear God's audible voice, but actually going to the words that are in Scripture, which are our life. A lot of time the answer is they're waiting for us. And and too often we're thinking, oh, I just need to hear God's voice. And instead we just got to read God's Scripture. And one of the things I want you to, we want to do today, and I mentioned this earlier, is I want you now to look at that problem that you wrote at the top of your page. And I'm going to give you a question. And each question that we go through will help you uh, reinforce the step onto the problem, if that makes sense. So the question you need to ask is, what does God say? What does God say? And that's in regards to the problem or the decision that you put at the top of that page. What does God say? The next step that we need to look at is getting the facts. Economic data in the United States for the year of 2012 showed us something very interesting about new business. And that is that a business, brand new, just started from scratch, 80% of those businesses will not survive their first year. 
If you go even further than that, 80% of those that survive the first year will not survive to year five, and 80% of those will not survive until year 10. If you do the math on that, that means on average, 99% of new businesses will fail by year 10. 99%. And I can't imagine the statistics in Canada are much different. Now, the interesting thing to note about those statistics is that there is a certain business group that bucks this trend. Every time they looked at them, these businesses succeeded when they shouldn't have. Does anybody want to hazard a guess as to which businesses these are? Franchises. So we're talking Starbucks, Tim Hortons, McDonald's, anything that's got that big brand name attached to it. Why is it? Why can they avoid this 99% rule? And the reason is, is because these businesses have learned this step. Get the facts. These franchise offices will do their homework. They will figure out where a business makes sense before they will ever grant that license to the person purchasing it. I know this for a reality because for years and years and years, there has been people trying to put a Chevrolet dealership in Cochrane and Chevy won't let them do it. And it's simply because they've done their homework. They've put in the effort. They've looked at the information. And they won't grant the franchise because they don't think it's going to be successful. It may sound harsh, but there's a reason behind it. Now, what we have to do is we have to look at the decision that we've got to make. And we've got to start getting the facts. We've got to do our due diligence, right? Find the information. Ask the appropriate people. Read the books. Listen to podcasts. Find it on Google if you have to. Just make sure it's a reliable source. Right? Find the information. Get the facts. Proverbs 13, 16 says, All who are prudent act with knowledge, but fools expose their folly. And I imagine if I were to take the time this morning to do a survey, I probably would get unanimous consent if I asked, what would you rather do? Would you rather make a good decision or a fast decision? I think everybody here would say they'd rather make the good decision. They'd rather not go through the headache and heartache of of a difficult one. And yet we create this pressure. Sometimes even the pressure is put upon us to make the decision quickly. And some of you, when I asked you to write that decision at the top of your page, all of a sudden your heart started to boil. You got stressed out. Your hands started to get clammy. Maybe your blood pressure rose a little bit. And it's because there's so much stress and worry surrounding that statement that you put at the top of the page that you can't even make the decision. You've just stressed yourself right out. But what you need to remember is that slowing down is not necessarily a bad thing if it's to get the right information. In fact, if you look at the scripture that Pastor Dave uh, mentioned earlier, pressure never comes from God when it comes to making this type of a decision. He says his yoke is easy. His burden is light, right? Now he'll put some pressure on us in certain areas, right? When it comes to things like character development and things like that. But if it's a business decision or it's a work decision, the pressure is not coming from God. The pressure is coming from either you or from your boss or friends or whatever it is. And so you need to let that pressure go by getting the facts. Proverbs fourteen sixteen says, a wise man is cautious and avoids danger. A fool plunges ahead with great confidence. So the second question you need to ask when you're looking at your decision that you need to make is what do I need to know? What do I need to know? And once you figure out the answer to that, go get the information, right? Run to the library if you have to, whatever it is to get the information you need to make that decision. You got to do the research, whatever it is. Now, the third step that Solomon outlines is asking for advice. And I think when it comes to this, too often we would rather make the mistake, or I guess we would rather make the decision and be wrong than to ask for help. I don't know why that is. Uh, Maybe it's fear or insecurity, whatever it is. We would rather make the mistake on our own. The problem with that approach is the fact that we have all of this experience at our doorstep. We have people who have made these mistakes, learned from them. 
They've already gone through the difficult aspect of figuring out what not to do and what to do. And yet we avoid these people like the plague for some reason. Whether it's pride or fear, whatever it is, we think that we can learn more through our own experience rather than trusting the history of someone else who's made the same decision as we are. And I think for some reason, we think that we're the only person in history that has had to make a decision. We don't trust that other people have gone through the roller coasters, the emotional aspects of of a bad decision. And this reminded me actually of a comic uh, that we found earlier this week, and I thought it was pretty pertinent given that Friday was the release of the new iPhone, for anybody that didn't know. It says, I know we can't afford it, but that serpent is so convincing, and you know I can't resist apples. (laughs) Who are you getting your advice from? And I'm a pro-Apple guy, by the way, so all in humor. But life is short. Why do we think that we have to experience everything for ourselves? Why can't we just trust those around us and pull on those that that are around us, pull on their advice? Now, there is a caution with this one. You don't ask just anybody. When you're looking at asking for advice, we got to go back to what Pastor Dave talked about last week, and that is our shape. And we got to figure out who is it in our lives that knows who we really are. Who knows my giftings? Who knows my heart? Who knows my abilities? Who knows my personality and my experiences to help me make this decision the right way? Take, for example, if you're someone who has zero musical ability, right? You've never picked up an instrument. Maybe you can't carry a tune. You have no uh, ability to carry rhythm. And if my brother-in-law is watching online, this is you. And he knows it. Cannot carry a tune. But what if he were to go and try out for the Calgary Philharmonic Orchestra? And if he surrounded himself with the wrong people. People that would go, yeah, go for it. That's awesome. Give it a try. And people like me are going, you're nuts. You're crazy. Can't get a tune out of a paper bag. Right? I mean, these are the type of people who are going to be willing to speak into your life in truth and in love because they know who you really are. Proverbs has a ton of examples in regards to getting wise counsel. Proverbs 20:18 says, Plans succeed through good counsel. Don't go to war without wise advice. Proverbs 15:22 says, Plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors they succeed. And then Proverbs 24, 6, surely you need guidance to wage war. Victory is won with many advisors. Victory is won with many advisors. So the question you need to ask here is who can advise me? Who can advise me? Pinpoint the exact people. And maybe a related but valuable question is who's already gone where I want to go? Who's already gone where I want to go? So our first three steps, we've got to check the Bible. We've got to get the facts. We've got to ask for advice. And fourthly, we need to set a goal. Now, we all have dreams that we would like to accomplish in life. But it is often in relation to these dreams that we have the most difficult decisions. Right? How am I going to accomplish my dream? How am I going to get it to fruition? Maybe it has to do with your career path. I want to be at a manager by this time, and and maybe I want to eventually become the CEO of some company. Maybe it's how fast you'd like to climb the corporate ladder. Whatever it is, we have these dreams. But the ability to move that dream into reality, the ability to move it from just faith to an actual goal, is to set a date. There has to be a tangible aspect to it. It has to be uh, time sensitive in some way. Many of you are probably familiar with uh, what we call smart goals or smart decisions. We use this often in the um, annual review process, right? Again, it's an acrostic specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, time sensitive. And the thing is, we have this, these ideas already. We know we're supposed to make smart goals, but often we limit it to our corporate environment. We limit it to our annual review. And instead, we should be taking this 
uh, tool that we've been given and use it for every decision in our life. Can I set a goal? Can I make it specific? Can I make it measurable? Is it attainable? If it's not attainable, maybe you need to set smaller goals or milestones to get you there eventually, right? And make sure you make it time sensitive because what this does, when you make it a smart goal, is the fact that you bring focus to that dream. So instead of it just being out there in your imagination, you now have it uh, set up tangibly. I must do this, then I must do this, then I must do this, then I must do this, instead of it just being out there somewhere. Just a dream. Proverbs 17, 24 says, Sensible people keep their eyes glued on wisdom, but a fool's eyes wander to the ends of the earth. And the Good News translation says it like this, An intelligent person aims at wise decision, but a fool starts off in many directions. It's about focus. It's about maintaining that, um, almost that laser vision. And so the question you need to ask is, what is my goal? What is my goal? Sometimes a goal, even when set, can seem unattainable. And that's when we've got to apply this smart methodology, like I said. And we see it in Roman, or sorry, Proverbs 4, 25 through 27. Look straight ahead. Fix your eyes on what lies before you. Mark out a straight path for your feet. Stay on the safe path. Don't get sidetracked. Keep your feet from following evil. It's a matter of setting goals, setting small goals and big goals and getting them uh, relevant and timely, as we said, the smart aspect to it. And if you're able to move past that aspect, if you set your goal and you want to uh, move, like I said, sequentially through these steps, the next thing you need to do is count the cost. There's the classic quote that anything worth doing will cost you something. And Jesus, I think, is the prime example of this. He knew right away that saving all of humanity was going to cost him something was going to cost him something very dear. Not only did he have to give up heaven for a period of time, but he had to give up his life as well. But he counted the cost and he followed through with it. The idea, the dream, the decision that you have to make, whether it's in business or just life in general, it's going to cost you something. And what you need to do is properly evaluate that cost. And not only evaluate what it is, but whether or not you're willing to pay for it. Now, as soon as you start talking costs, right away you start thinking money. But the fact is, is there are four ways that you need to count the cost. That is time, energy, money, and relationships. Time, energy, money, relationships. How much time is this going to take me? Can I afford that time? How much of an impact is that time going to have into the other aspects of my life? Right? If you want to succeed at work, but it's going to ask you to take extra hours of overtime, what type of impact is that going to have on your family, on your friends? These are the type of questions you need to ask yourself. Right? How much of my energy will it take? Can I afford how tired this is going to make me? This is a great question if you're thinking about becoming a parent. How tired am I willing to be to achieve this, to make this decision of having kids? How much money is it going to cost me? Again, a good one for kids. It's going to cost you a lot, but you make the decision. You go through this evaluation process. But from a business standpoint, if you're thinking of changing careers or going back to school or, or facilitating a certain project, you need to decide, okay, what if the economy does a downturn. What if I lose my job? Maybe you're a BlackBerry employee. Okay. I'm an Apple guy. I got to take a shot, right? But what, what if it puts a significant financial strain on your bank account? Right. How, it's, how is it going to affect my relationships? Is it going to hurt or hinder them? Like I said, if you're going to start putting in a bunch of overtime, you need to evaluate how that's going to affect your relationships. Close relationships, family, friends, as I said. Or is it could potentially help? I mean, the, this decision-making process is probably the one that I had the hardest point getting past when I decided to take this job here at the church. I had to go through these four elements. I had to decide whether or not I could pay the cost. I mean, there's obviously the time cost, right? 
for me, that one was an easy one because um, I didn't have to commute as far. Um, so that saved me a bunch of time that way. So that was a huge benefit for me. But in another aspect, I think I actually work more now than I did downtown. The difference is, is I actually enjoy what I'm doing, right? So it doesn't necessarily come down to numbers, right? I actually work more, but I enjoy it more. So it's not as big a deal to me. What if it comes down to money? I mean, that's significant. I was working for a really big firm downtown and I was switching into a not-for-profit environment. There was going to be some type of pay cut required. That's just the way it is. That's typical in a not-for-profit industry, whether you're a church or a charity, whatever it is. So I had to make that evaluation. And again, I had to evaluate in terms of relationships. And for me, that one was easy. I actually realized this was actually going to be more of a benefit for me. It wasn't actually going to cost me that much. It was actually going to improve my relationships. And at the time, Mary and I were engaged. So I'm like, this is great. Closer to home means I'm going to be able to spend more time with her. I can be home on weekends. We get to go to church together. I get to bring my kids to work sometimes, right? I'd never be able to do that downtown. So these are the things you have to evaluate. Some of us are even familiar with this idea of cost-benefit analysis. And we're really good at uh, applying the pros and cons to a business decision, to a project, and we forget that this is a really valuable tool to apply to our lives. You need to take the time, count the cost. Proverbs twenty twenty five says, don't trap yourself by making a rash promise and only later counting the cost. Jesus even talked about this in Luke 14, and it was uh, one of the parables we went through in our last series. So if you want to know what it's really about, you can go back and listen to that one uh, from late or early July, counting the cost. And so really the question you need to ask is, what will this cost me? You look again at that decision that is at the top of your page, and what is this going to cost me? If you can't pay the price, whatever that is, there's no point in looking at the next steps. There's no point in moving past it and going through the whole decision-making process if you're not willing to pay the price. Because it's a lot easier to get into things than it is to get out of things. It's a lot easier to get into debt than out of debt. It's a lot easier to get into a relationship than out of a relationship. It's a lot easier to fill your schedule than to tell somebody no. It's a lot easier to empty your energy tank than to try and fill it back up. You have to count the cost before making your decision. So we've checked the Bible. We've got our facts. We've asked for advice. We've set a goal. We've counted the cost. Solomon then tells us we need to plan for problems. Step six, plan for problems. Now, planning doesn't mean you're lacking faith. It, do, it just means that you're using wisdom in your decision-making process. Remember, planning for problems doesn't mean you're going to solve all of the problems right now. I think if that were the case, none of us would get out of today, right? We'd be so focused on the future that we'd just kind of blow our minds, right? And I think that is the reason why. In fact, I know it's the reason why Scripture says, don't worry about tomorrow. Today has enough of a problem. God gives us the strength for today. Right? Because we, if we were to look at all of the problems of tomorrow, we wouldn't even do it. I mean, for those of us that are parents, and I think the reason I have this whole parent thing in my head is because we had the women's retreat and I had my kids by myself for 24 hours. So I'm seeing the parent theme sneak into this sermon all the way through, even though it's supposed to be on business. But I think if we were to think about all the problems that we were going to have with our kids, we probably wouldn't have had kids in the first place. But a little bit more business focused than that. If we look back at John F. Kennedy, when he made the announcement about going to the moon, he said, we're going to be landing on the moon in the next decade. And when he made that proclamation, they didn't have any of the technology, the resources to be able to do it. They'd never built a rocket other than maybe to, to launch a missile, but nothing to put people up into space. I mean, if you think about it now, there's more technology in my iPad than there was in the Apollo space mission. And yet they accomplished their goal. Absolutely, there were problems along the way. You can study the whole history of the Apollo program. It's really fascinating. But they achieved it. They kept pushing through it. And maybe planning, simply put, is understanding that problems are inevitable. 
And all you really should do is just put things in place to make sure that when those problems come, they don't hold you back from achieving that goal you set earlier. This might mean developing a budget, putting some fiscal responsibilities or or restrictions in place so that you've got a bank account ready to go in case of an economic downturn. You can weather the storm. If you're responsible for supervising people, even if it's for yourself, maybe that means providing skills training for employees. Going and taking a course for yourself so that you see, okay, this problem could happen. Doesn't mean it will. It could happen. So I'm going to go to school for this to make sure I can handle that problem. That's what preparing for the future is about. It's not about solving the problem. It's about preparing for it. So whatever problem comes your way, you got to make sure you plan for it. Proverbs 22.3 says, A prudent person foresees danger and takes precautions. The simpleton goes blindly on and suffers the consequences. One of the other translation actually doesn't use the word simple or uh, simpleton. It uses the word stupid person. It's being pretty blunt here, right? Plan, prepare. So what you need to do is you need to ask yourself, what could go wrong? Again, looking at that decision you've written at the top of your page, what could go wrong? And then you prepare accordingly. You use wisdom in the decision-making process. The seventh step that Solomon looks at is facing your fears. Now, if you're facing a problem right now, you've gone through the previous six steps. You've got a a check mark every step of the way. You're like, yep, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. I've set my plans. I've asked for advice. Everything is giving me a green light and you still can't take that step. Then it's probably fear that's holding you back. Because fear is the key, the root of indecision. And it's only in facing that fear of of indecision that you are going to be able to conquer that fear. You're going to be able to make that decision. And we have to understand that we're not alone in this. Just look at all of the examples in the Old Testament over and over again. There's um, God saying, here is this amazing dream I have for you. And the person goes, yeah, I don't think so. I've got an excuse, right? I mean, the amazing thing is, is God gives them the choice and Moses comes along. He says, I can't speak well. Gideon says, I'm too young, too poor, too unimportant. Abraham says he's too old, right? Every, every excuse you can imagine these people did, but they overcame those excuses because really the excuse is just hiding the fact that you're scared to do it. We do the same thing. You say, I'm not good enough. I don't have enough money. I'm not smart enough. I don't have the time. And we go on and on and on and on, not realizing that the reason we're making these excuses is that we're afraid to take the step. What we need to do is remember this verse from Ecclesiastes 11.4. It says, farmers who wait for perfect weather never plant. If they watch every cloud, they never harvest. I have a father-in-law who's a farmer, and this verse makes a whole lot more sense to me now than it used to. But just in case, the Living Bible says it very clearly. It says, if you wait for perfect conditions, you will never get anything done. There's no such thing as perfect conditions. And if you want to know more about facing your fears, we actually did a sermon on it back in the spring as part of our Dream Up series called Face My Fears. And so I'd encourage you to grab the podcast, make sure you can uh, listen to that. It'll provide you a whole lot more insight than I've got time for this morning. But the question you need to ask is, what am I afraid of? Am I afraid of failure? Well, that can be overcome. You're going to fail. It's just whether you get back up or not. God gives us the ability, the skill, the encouragement to be able to get past that. Are you afraid of people? That can be overcome. We can move past these fears. What are you afraid of? State it. Flat out state what it is. Because part of the issue with fear is that it grips us because we hold it inside. We don't tell anybody what we're afraid of. And it's when we bring it into the light that we realize it's not that big of a deal. And if we still think it's a big deal, go back to step three. Go back to your advisors. Right? Have them look at it and they'll be like, you know what? You're just, don't worry about it. It's not that big of a deal. You'll get past it. You'll overcome it. They'll encourage you. They'll lift you up. Whatever it is, move past the fear. And so we've made our way through this process. We've checked the Bible. We've got an okay there. God says, yep, go ahead and do it. You've got the facts. You've got all of the information. You're ready to take that step. You've asked for advice. All of your uh, close advisors, your friends, the ones that really know you've said, yep, go for it. You've set your goal. 
that's in place. You've counted the cost. You're willing to pay for it in terms of time, energy, money, and relationships. You've planned for problems. You're all set. And you've decided, you know what? I'm not going to let fear hold me back. I'm ready to go. So what is the eighth step? You've got to take the step. You've got to step out in faith. You've got to pull the trigger. You've got to move forward. Whatever the euphemism is that you want to use, there has to be forward progress. In every single decision you make in life, you're going to be scared, especially if God is the one telling you to do it. And the reason is, is because you're outside of your comfort zone. You don't have control. And so you've got to take a leap. That's why they call it a leap of faith, because it takes risk. But you've gone through the previous seven steps. So this, all you have to do is this last one, take the step. Classic scripture, Proverbs 3, 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. Faith is a tricky thing because it means that we've got to let go. We've got to give up our control. But the thing is, is if you have control, is it really a step of faith? If you think that you have some measure of control over the situation, you're not trusting God enough. You need to give that up, take the step of faith, because it's only when the decision is outside of our control. It's only when it moves us outside of our comfort zone and we've really placed our trust in God that we're going to be able to accomplish the goal, to be able to achieve the dream, to have success in that dream and that vision and that decision that you've written down at the top. So the question you need to ask is, where do I need to trust God? And maybe this morning you've never trusted God before. You've never given your life over to Jesus. That needs to be your first step. You're never going to be able to get through step eight without this. You've got to place your trust in him. And if you've never placed your trust in God before, if you've never accepted Jesus into your life, then I want to talk to you after the service. Straight up. I want to talk to you. I want to find out what's holding you back. I want to chat with you. I want to encourage you. We've got a package here called our Yes Packet that I would love to give you to help you on that journey. And believe me, you're not going to understand everything. And that's why it's a leap of faith, right? In every aspect. Maybe you've accepted Jesus. Maybe you did it last week and you need, you're wondering, okay, what's the next step? Well, the next step is easy. It's baptism. Jesus exampled it for us. He showed us what to do. We have one coming up later on in the fall. So if that has to be your next step, if that is your next step, grab a baptism package from our guest center. We want to walk you through that step. And finally, maybe what's holding you back is you jump back to step three and you're like, I don't have any advisors. I don't know anybody that knows me. I don't know anybody that knows my shape that can properly advise me. Well, then I've got good news for you. Next week's Rally Sunday. It's our small group sign up. And right away, you can get plugged into a tight knit community of people who you can reveal your your true self to. You can begin to grow and work with them. And all of a sudden, you're going to be surrounded with a ton of advisors who really know who you are, who really know your shape. So when you come out next week, come with an anticipation. You know what? I need to find some people that I can really be myself with. I need to find a small group. I need to plug in. Whatever your step of faith needs to be, you all have your decisions written down. Whatever that step of faith needs to be, take it. If you've made your way through eight steps, take it. Don't delay jump into the adventure. Why don't you stand with me this morning? God, I thank you so much, God, for your work in our lives, for the wisdom that comes from your scriptures. And God, I pray for this decision that people have written down on their paper, this decision-making process. God, I pray for your wisdom, God, as they go through these eight steps with you. God, that you would show them, God, that really... The reason you want us to make wise decisions is because you desire us to have success and blessing. God, you desire to see us have an abundant life and and to get closer with you. And God, just you're always for us. So God, I pray that you would help us to make these decisions. God, with the wisdom of the ages, which is you being by our side. And we thank you for your scriptures that teach us how. And God, I just pray right now your blessing, your favor, God, God, your success upon every single person here right now. In Jesus' name, amen.